Hi students and welcome to today's Live IELTS class. My name is Adrian. I'm streaming to you from beautiful Central Europe. I hope everybody has had a good week and is looking forward to a fantastic weekend. Hi Marjona. Hi Deepti. Nisha, good to see many students. Welcome Bharat. Good to see our members. In this class, everyone, we are looking at the listening section, comprehending uh, for that perfect band nine score. Hi, Alpha Forest. Again, uh, this lesson is brought to you by aehelp.com for academic IELTS success. Visit us there. For the general IELTS, check us out at gieltshelp.com. That's generalieltshelp.com. On both of those websites, we have lots and lots of materials to help you improve your communication, your vocabulary, and get those high band scores. Welcome, Rashika. Hi, Carolina. Just a quick look at our websites. This is our academic one here with the blue background. Click that red button to join the premium package. It is a one-time payment for lifetime access, so you can study without worrying about subscriptions or having to pay again. Uh, for the general IELTS, it's the green background. You can click that big red button uh, to join us there. And again, lifetime subscription for a one-time payment. We're an official IELTS uh, registration center, and we have IELTS certified agents working on our team. If you have questions, uh, you can send me an email to adrian at aehelp.com, and I will get back to you in short notice. If you'd like our exam books uh, in a paper-based uh, book format, uh, you can order them from Amazon, AE Helps Academic IELTS, and GE Helps General IELTS. And uh, tomorrow, members, we have a question and answer session. So get your questions ready for tomorrow. And then for everyone tomorrow, we will have a speaking part three class as well. Now, um, yesterday we did listening part one and part two. Uh, does everybody remember what listening part one and part two were about? What were the topics? We're continuing uh, that today. So anybody remember what we did yesterday? It's good to jog your memory and practice recalling what you learned. Art, I hope you will get a good high score as well. Welcome, Eugene. All right. Uh, Arda says it was about registration at the university. Yep, and Alpha Forest says part two was um, a resort tour. Yeah, be specific, uh, everyone. So part one was um, registration problems with uh, second uh, year of university, right? And part two was um, a tour of a Cuban uh, resort. Okay, that's specific. Uh, anybody remember what part three will be about today? So can anybody recall what we will be looking at uh, today for uh, part three and part four? Remember I used the introduction time for or the instruction time uh, to take a kind of a sneak peek at um, part three and part four, okay? Does anybody remember what it will be about? Um, Mandeep says loggerhead turtle, and Sandeep says part three, something about zoos. Yeah, so part three will be uh, zoos, and part four will be something about a turtle. Very good. Okay, cool. So let's do this. Uh, we're going to do the listening uh, together. Uh, we'll get right into part three, and then we'll talk strategy as we go through the answers. I'm going to play the audio through my headset and a nice speaker. So if it's quiet for you, turn up the volume. Okay, use a headset if you have one. And uh, don't put your answers, do not put your answers into the chat. Give everybody a fair chance to listen and answer on their own. Um, again, this is coming from our second exam book, uh, fourth test. And uh, I'm just going to hop over to our website here. I'm going to log in to my student account. 
Once I'm logged into my student account, I can access my audio CDs. And it's very logical. Uh, test four will be CD four, uh, track three, because we're starting with part three. So test four, part three, CD four, uh, track three. And we're going to uh, get going right away. So listen, answer, and we will go through the answers together at the end. Again, don't put it into the chat. Um, just uh, put your answers on a separate piece of paper or a separate document. Here we go, everyone. Now turn to section three. Take some time to look at questions 21 to 26. Listening section three. You will hear a panel discussion on the ethics of zoos. Now listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 26. Welcome everyone to this very special evening. Tonight's speakers are two distinguished scholars. Dr. Henry Gergen from the University of Edinburgh is a philosopher and animal rights advocate. Dr. Gloria Mesto from Trinity College Dublin is an animal conservationist. Welcome to you both. The topic of tonight's discussion is the ethics of zoos. Here is the fundamental question. Is it right to house animals in zoos or should they live freely in nature instead? As an animal rights advocate and theorist, I have clear views on this question. To me, it is fundamentally wrong to lock up animals for human enjoyment. I believe that in many important respects, animals are persons and should be afforded many of the rights that human beings have. Chief among these is the right to liberty and the freedom to achieve one's desired aims in life. Clearly, these rights are abrogated by imprisonment within the zoo. Moreover, in many cases, animals in zoos are treated inhumanely and are subject to confinement in extremely small spaces. While regulation of zoos may help mitigate some of these problems, I maintain that zoos are fundamentally unethical. I certainly understand Dr. Gergen's position, and I do agree on some of his points, most notably that zoos must be held to higher standards of animal treatment than they are currently. But my colleague fails to consider an important point in favor of zoos. The conservation of species is an incredibly important endeavor, and zoos are on the front line in the battle to save hundreds of species of animals around the world. Zoos often employ some of the leading experts in the field who are best equipped to carry out this important task. It is for this reason that I believe zoos are justified. Though they may not be perfect, I believe zoos and the experts they employ play a critical role in the conservation of species and therefore are ethically permissible. Dr. Gergen, do you have a rebuttal to that point? Yes, certainly. While I appreciated Dr. Mester's position as a conservationist, and I do appreciate the work she and others like her do for animal welfare around the world, I must disagree with her. While zoos certainly do play a role in animal conservation, it is not because they are zoos that they play this role. Dr. Gergen, can you clarify that point for the audience? Of course. What I mean is this. It is not inherent in the idea of a zoo that they conserve animals. The notions are separable. You can have an animal conservation effort that is not a zoo, just as you can have a zoo that has nothing to do with conservation. So while it is true that some zoos act as animal preserves, this does not justify the existence of zoos, since we could easily separate out these animal preserves from zoos themselves. Fair point, but such animal preserves would still have the associated problems of poor treatment and unsuitable living conditions. Yes but at least it would be in an effort towards a positive end. The animals would not be captive forever, and they would not be captive merely for a human audience. You now have some time to look at questions 27 to 30.
Now listen to the rest of the interview and answer questions 27 to 30. What about the enjoyment and education that zoos provide, especially to young people? Perhaps individuals like yourselves were inspired to become animal advocates by attending a zoo when you were a child. That is a really interesting point. I was indeed inspired by going to a zoo when I was a child. What do you think, Dr. Gergen? It is an interesting thought. What if the positive outcomes caused by inspiring people like us to do good in the future outweigh the harms done to zoo animals? I'm not sure I would have to think about it more, but it's certainly an interesting question. Well, thank you. I'll take that as a compliment. In closing, I'm not sure how much progress we've made, but is it safe to say that we can all agree that zoos, at the very least, must do their best to improve the treatment of animals and the conditions in which the animals live? I would certainly agree with that, as I'm sure my friends would also agree. That is the end of section three. You will now have half a minute to check your answers. All right, everyone, and check your answers in that half minute. Uh, make sure you didn't make any simple mistakes with spelling and so on. I'm just going to stop our audio here and then we'll go through the questions and answers together to get some more clarity. All right, so section three, obviously a little bit more put together. It's conversation. There's a British, New Zealand, and uh, a Canadian accent in this uh, conversation. It's different professors. They do this because when you're a university student, you will often meet with uh, professors from different parts of the world. I know I did uh, in my classes uh, in the University of Victoria. Uh, so you have to be able to listen to different accents in English as well. And sometimes IELTS will have different accents, English accents, but uh, different accents. Okay, so here um, for the first one, it was a kind of an, a gentle start, let's say. Uh, you had to match the um, uh, the professor with their university. Now this was for question 21, so be careful. This is a kind of a tricky one too here because in your answer key, uh, this one will be just one question. It'll be 21 like this, and then you would put one something and two uh, something. So um, one A to B is what uh, Moria says. Uh, so yeah, these kind of just matched across. So Dr. Henry Gergen is University of Edinburgh, and Dr. Gloria Mesto is Trinity College. So it was 1A to B. So in your question booklet, or your answer booklet, you need to make sure that it looks like this. So uh, be careful, okay? All right. Um, so uh, that's uh, 21. Um, it was fairly simple. The introduction, you just had to kind of pay attention. Make sure uh, that you pay attention right from uh, the beginning, okay? All right, um, and then uh, we had questions 22 to 24. Okay. Um, here, this is this kind of multi, uh, multiple uh, choice question. This is a multi multiple choice question. And um, for this type of question, it's really tricky to try to just stare at the possible choices and pick them out real quick. So you have to use um, two different techniques, two different skills for this. Uh, I've given you advice about this. Let's see if any of our students that are in classes uh, for a longer time, remember what you should do for this type of question. So when you have multiple multi-choice, I call this multiple multi-choice uh, question because it's basically multiple choice. You have A, B, C, D, E, F, but you're not just choosing one, you're choosing in this case uh, three different ones. Uh, you have to use two strategies. Carolina says, number one is take notes. So very good, Carolina. So pay attention to the question which three of the following are arguments against zoos? So why are zoos negative? You have to think about that and you have to take notes. That's one. What's the other that you should do? Okay, so you take notes real quick. What is the, what is the other step that you should do? There's one other step that uh, 
that you should pay attention to. So take notes and use what? Not highlights. Yeah, Prashita says don't just stare at the choices. That's right. They're not going to, it's very difficult. It's not just going to hop out at you. Mahmoud, very good. Use logic. Yeah, logic, logic. Okay, so notes and logic. Um, I mean, this was what I would, you know, do with this question. So uh, what are the logical reasons that zoos are bad or negative? And uh, what are your answers for this? So uh, what are the logical reasons? What would most people say uh, zoos are bad? So what would you say? Why, why is a zoo not necessarily a good um, type of entertainment? Okay. Uh, we did just do the listening. Okay. Um, yeah, so Mahmoud says zoo is a prison for animals. Okay, yeah. Uh, Mahmoud says animals should be free. Okay, yeah. Sure. Okay, what else? Give me some other logical answers. Me personally, I would say animals have feelings. And do not deserve uh, punishment, right? So why? Why punish an animal, right? They didn't do anything bad. Why would, you, why would we want to do something bad for them? Uh, keeping them in a box or in a cage is obviously uh, not a uh, very friendly way to treat the animals. So it's, uh, they're treated inhumanely, right? Uh, Marty says they lose their instinct, okay? Um, so yeah, so thinking about those, all right? So logic will help you and taking notes will help you. All right, so now considering those, uh, what were the correct answers here? Uh, the three that were given were A, B, and F, okay? So animals are treated inhumanely. So they're not treated in a way that's respectable of being a human, right? Keeping it in cages. Animals are persons. So this professor says animals are living creatures with feelings. They're persons, okay? And uh, they're fundamentally wrong. So uh, basically, it's just wrong to capture another animal and put it into a box just so we can point at it and go, oh, look at that. Um, so professor says they're fundamentally wrong. Uh, they're not human beings. That's weird. That's not logical. Um, animals should not be in prison. Um, that one is just kind of awkward because it's not a prison. I mean, it seems like one, but it's not actually a prison. Um, and the conservation of species is obviously wrong logic. Okay. So A, B, and F. All right. Okay. So you had answers 22 to 24 there. Now let's look at the rest of them. So again, in your answer sheets, uh, this would have been three, by the way. So... 22, 23, 24, and uh, you could have done uh, B, A, F. The order doesn't matter. Uh, each one is worth one point, okay? So the good news here is if you get one wrong, and you don't get all of them wrong, but you do get that one wrong. Okay, so this was a fill in the blanks. Uh, for this one, you really have to pay attention to the given sentence, uh, they often will say uh, not the exact same sentence, but something similar so you can catch it. In order to improve the conditions for zoo animals, zoos must be held to, and then here it's two words, uh, of animal treatment. And they kind of emphasize this a couple of times. So for these fill in the blanks, they will often repeat the answer at least a couple times. So you will hear it and they often will emphasize it. So you'll hear the words kind of strongly stated. They will go, duh, duh, okay? So Nadia says, higher standards. Yeah, you're right, Nadia. So, and that's the way 
the speaker say it in order to improve the conditions for zoo animals zoos must be held to a higher standards or higher standards of animal treatment there's no a uh, there's no article so it's going to be a plural here higher standards uh, okay watch the articles if there's no a uh, it's a plural all right so it must be held to higher standards of animal treatment okay all right number 26 while zoos do conserve animal life dr gergen argues that this function could also be performed by and again they say this a couple of different times okay so both professors use this word a couple of times and they keep emphasizing it. So when you hear that kind of repeated word, okay? Um, so animal, yeah, preserves, yeah. Not preservation, preserves, yeah. Okay, animal preserves. Animal preserves are basically special parks that are for animals where animals can live safely. Uh, without the danger of hunters or um, predatory animals. So they're called animal preserves. Okay. Uh, number 27, uh, again, this, these last three, four answers, they came really quickly, but as long as you're listening for it, they were really there. So uh, number 27, enjoyment and something are two key positive at, uh, attributes of zoos. And again, if you put yourself in this position, you can kind of figure this out because a lot of us do this when we visit a zoo. Uh, Prashitha Arda uh, FN, Rashika, I'll agree that it's education. Yeah, yeah, because we go there and we learn, right? When we read uh, those little information plaques that they have, um, in front of uh, the exhibits, we learn about those animals, where they live, how many there are, their habits, some interesting facts. So uh, enjoyment and education. Okay, now this was again multiple choice, so you had to listen for the answer, okay? And here Dr. Gergen says this very clearly. Again, he emphasizes, so according to Dr. Gergen, does the value of inspiring young people outweigh the negative aspects of zoos? So he's thinking about that, and he gives an interesting answer. He says, eh, I'm not sure. I'd have to think about that, right, is what he says. And I can see that a lot of you caught that. So he's not sure. You'd have to think about that. He's like, I think I'd have to think about that a little bit, right? So the inspirational value of zoos. Okay, um, and so what is the interesting question? A, whether zoos are ethical, whether the inspirational value of zoos outweighs their negative aspects, whether enjoyment and inspiration negate the importance of zoos for number 29. Prashita, Rashika, very good. Yeah, it's B. So whether inspiration uh, this value or this benefit of zoos is more important than the negative parts. Uh, hard argument. I'd say let's go on safaris instead. But um, yeah, I agree that B is the correct answer. Okay, good job, Carolina, Vaishnavi, Bakrat. Nicely done. All right. Uh, and the last uh, question for part three. What do the guests agree on? Zoo conditions need to be improved. Zoos are unethical. The inspirational value of zoos is unethical. Uh, read these carefully as long as you understand them. And if you think, lo again, logic for multiple choice is really important. So Arda, very good. It's A, yeah, zoo conditions need to be improved. Yeah, I mean, I think all of us agree. If you've ever been to a zoo, you'd probably be like, yeah, you know, it can always be a bigger better place um, with a uh, cleaner and happier environment for sure. Okay, so that's part three. Let's get moving right on to part four. So part four is going to be a little bit more challenging because there are no breaks uh, during part four. So when you're doing part four, really be ready to just 
comprehend and move along with the information. In part four, uh, comprehension is the key. You really have to focus much more on the audio than the questions in some way because the you, it's hard to move fast enough with the question. So as long as you can hear all of the audio and understand it, you can answer the questions, okay? Just by staring at the questions in part four, it's really hard to do a good job, okay? All right, so again, I'm going to play this through my headset microphone. Um, don't put your answers in the chat, just put it uh, on a separate piece of paper, okay? And we'll go through the answers uh, afterwards together, okay? So I'm gonna hop back to our website here and play the audio off the website. Of course, it's a high quality MP3 recording when you're listening on your phone or at home to the website. Um, here we go, everyone, okay? So listen, answer, and we'll share the answers at the end, okay? Now turn to section four. Take some time to look at questions 31 to 40. Listening section four. You will hear a professor discussing the migration of loggerhead turtles. Now listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 40. It's late April on the South Atlantic coast of North America, and one of the most remarkable journeys in all of nature is about to begin. The loggerhead turtle, whose natural habitat is the open ocean, has to seek dry land to lay its eggs. The sandy beaches of Florida provide a perfect nesting spot with soft sand that can be dug up by the persistent flippers of the female loggerhead. Over the course of the next three months, hundreds of thousands of eggs will be laid on such beaches. Many of these eggs will become the victim of predators, but many will survive to hatching, which occurs two months after being laid. Hatching marks the beginning of an incredible journey for the loggerhead turtle. Almost immediately upon hatching, the young turtles, known as hatchlings at this point, head for the open ocean. The ocean, while full of its own dangers and predators, provides a relative safe haven for the hatchlings of the predators that live near the shoreline. These young turtles embark upon a journey that will take them upwards of 13,000 kilometers around the North Atlantic. Many animals make large and incredible journeys, but what makes the loggerhead turtle's migration so notable is the speed at which the animal moves. While many bird species make similar journeys, they move at velocities much faster than the loggerhead turtle. This slow moving beast travels at the remarkably sluggish pace of only three quarters of a kilometer per hour. This means it will take the turtle a minimum of 17,000 hours to complete its migratory journey not even taking into account stops for feeding and sleep. To put that number in perspective, 17,000 hours is approximately two years of non-stop swimming. That the loggerhead turtle makes this journey alone makes it all the more impressive. From birth to adolescence to adulthood, the loggerhead turtle is a solitary traveler. But how does it know where to go? Doesn't it need a parent to help it know the route? This is where the loggerhead becomes even more fascinating. Recent research tells us the loggerhead uses the magnetic field of the Earth to determine its migration route. Because the Earth's magnetic field differs in each location around the world, the loggerhead turtle can use it as a kind of innate roadmap, illuminating the way to where they need to be. One example of this is the behaviour they exhibit when they encounter the particular magnetic field off the coast of Portugal. Instead of continuing north, towards the cold waters of northern Europe, they sense the magnetic field and turn around, instead heading for the warmer waters of northwestern Africa. And it is not just that the loggerhead turtle has a sort of innate compass. They are able to determine, with surprising precision, their latitude and longitude. They know exactly when to zig and zag to optimise their migratory pattern. Even with their incredible ability to know where they are and where they need to be, 
the survival rate of migratory loggerhead turtles is incredibly low. In fact, only about one in 4,000 hatchlings makes it back to the beach in eastern Florida to mate and lay its eggs. However, that any make it at all is an incredible achievement and one of the great natural wonders of navigation. That is the end of section four. You will now have half a minute to check your answers. Okay, students, and again, use that half minute to check your answers, especially in this kind of a part four where you're writing lots of words. So you want to make sure that your spelling is accurate. So definitely with lots of fill in the blanks, really give an extra attention to um, your uh, spelling, okay? All right, so let's do this. So this was a flow chart. In a flow chart, you really want to pay attention to some keywords to position yourself in the audio. So loggerhead turtle is a good kind of a uh, couple of words to pay attention to. Dry land, uh, lay eggs, uh, those are good to pay attention to. And then of course, uh, the sandy beaches of, and a name. So you're listening for a specific name here. And Nadia and Marty both say that that specific place is Florida. Now, Dostun, be careful. Make sure you use a capital F here because Florida is a state. It's a name. Florida. Um, and uh, if you don't use a capital, uh, you will get it wrong. Okay, so Florida, capital F, F-L. Um, if you want to avoid making that mistake, then when you're transferring your answers to the answer sheet in the paper-based exam, you can use all capital letters. Just make sure that you don't make any spelling mistakes during the transferring. Okay, so, um, and Florida provides the perfect location for nesting. After hatching, the loggerhead turtle immediately heads for the ocean. The ocean is safer than the shore because it has fewer what? Um, we've used this before, so fewer what, okay? Uh, Tushar, go one at a time. Some of your answers are not correct, okay? So fewer predators, predators, yeah, that's right. Okay, that's a common noun. You don't need to capitalize, so less predators. Predators are, of course, animals that will eat the other animal, okay? Predators, uh, plural. If you don't have the S, you get it wrong. The turtles embark on a journey that will take them, ooh, a lot of kilometers. How many kilometers around the ocean? Uh, Shukrat, it's not 13 kilometers. That would not be a very big journey around the ocean, uh, even for a smaller animal. Uh, 13,000 kilometers. Yeah, so just use the number here, 13,000. You can put a comma after 13 if you want, not a period. Uh, 13,000 kilometers around uh, the Atlantic Ocean. Yeah, so they're doing a lot of swimming, that's for sure. Boy, if I swam that much, I'd be very fit. <laughs> no question about that. <laughs> All right, so um, I've been doing a bit of running in the last couple of years, and I've just gotten to 2,000 kilometers, and I feel like that's a lot, and that's running. Uh, swimming, it's even 13,000. That's incredible. All right. Um, while long migratory journeys are fairly commonplace in nature, what makes the loggerhead's journey especially notable is the extremely something. So if you think of like uh, birds here and you can figure it out, it's sluggish. Yeah, coming from the word slug. Anybody know what a slug is? You might even find an emoji slug, uh, sluggish. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Sometimes we use animals to describe as an adjective like sluggish or slothish even. Yeah. Okay. So sluggish. Anybody find the uh, slug emoji? Um, <clears throat> anybody know what this is called? And it's not Gary from SpongeBob. Um, so anybody, anybody, oh, there we go. Kashir, so there you go. Yeah, I, I knew somebody would find that emoji. Um, all right. So yeah, so this is a snail because it has a house. And if it doesn't have a house, oh no, no house. 
It's called a slug. Okay, so snail, slug. Okay, slug is a snail without a house. All right, okay. All right, and we use that word to say very slow, sluggish. Um, sometimes we use that um, in, uh, f to describe how we're feeling. So uh, if you feel like you're having a really slow day, you don't have enough energy, and somebody asks you, how are you feeling? Uh, you can actually say, I'm, I'm feeling a bit sluggish today. Okay, uh, just repeat that after me. It's a, good, it's a good phrase to know. I'm feeling a bit sluggish today. And then the person will probably say, oh, why is that? And then you say, well, I didn't get very good sleep last night and I just feel low on energy. So I'm feeling a bit sluggish, okay? All right, um, so slug, sluggish, okay? All right, uh, let's keep going. So the entire journey is equal to approximately something of continuous swimming with no breaks. Now, she describes it in a couple different ways. What was the simplest uh, way? Uh, Marvik, another word for sluggish, if you were using it in the context I just explained, would be lethargic. Um, but in that context, it would be slow. Uh, Moria, two years. Yeah, that's the easiest, two years. Okay, so two years. Okay, uh, you can use the abbreviation. Just make sure you get it right. So two years, okay, it's good. All right, so two years of continuous swimming with no breaks. Wow. Okay, and then now we have to write no more than two words and or a number for each answer. As incredible as the loggerhead turtle's journey is, what makes it even more impressive is that the loggerhead is a what kind of a traveler? So unlike what we see in Disney movies with groups of loggerheads swimming around. Um, so uh, the loggerhead turtle is a solitary. That's right. It means alone. Solitary. Uh, they'll probably take the word solo. I think she uses that word as well, solo traveler. So a solitary traveler, traveling alone. Okay, solo, solitary means by oneself. Uh, traversing the open ocean on its own for years at a time. What an interesting life. Just swimming in the open ocean for years and years. Uh, scientific research has, in recent years, told us uh, that it is through a connection with the Earth's something that the turtle, uh, turtles find their way around the ocean. There's two words that are needed here. Uh, very good, Prashita. Prashita says it was the magnetic field. Yeah. Magnetic, two words, field. If you just wrote magnetic, it's not enough here, unfortunately, uh, that the turtles find their way around. For example, the turtles are able to sense something off the coast of another name of a place here that you had to get. Okay, so where do these turtles turn around and avoid cold northern waters of uh, Scandinavia and head south to Portugal? That's right. So oh, let's go south, let's go to warmer places. That makes them change their direction and head for Northwest Africa. Possessing more than a simple compass, the loggerhead can innately sense it's something and something. So what can it sense? It can sense its long longitude. And if you know the word longitude, then you will know this word because longitude and the other word is latitude, of course, for those geography students, latitude. Uh, students, these two words are very important to know in English. You never know when you might have to use them in your life to explain where you are. Okay, so um, those are the lines, the uh, arbitrary or uh, fictitious lines. The center one is called the equator. And then we have the Tropic of Cancer and the Tropic of Capricorn on the top and bottom. Those are kind of the famous ones. And then these are the longitude line, or sorry, um, yeah, so these are the longitude lines, and then these are the latitudes, okay, around the earth. So longitude, latitude, okay? Latitude, you can think of the word lateral as opposed to horizontal, okay? 
All right, uh, so that is uh, part four, okay? Oh, yeah, we have one more. Uh, let's not forget about this little factoid and very interesting one at that. Number 40, uh, approximately what percentage of hatchlings make it back to the breeding ground? This was kind of shocking, um, and, the, and the speaker gives the ratio or the proportion, and you have to use a little bit of math to change it to the percent. Um, looks like most students were able to do that. Yeah. So, uh, the speaker says one in 4,000 hatchlings make it back, uh, to Florida, to the breeding grounds. And unfortunately that is a very low number. It's a 0.025% number. Yeah. So very good. Okay. Uh, so how did you do everyone, especially, you know, those of you who were here yesterday as well. Uh, what was your score from 40? How, how did you do in this uh, speaking test that we covered yesterday and today? You can check your speaking score on our website. I'll show you where. So I can check your uh, speaking scores for you. We have a score converter on our website. I'll darken the screen because the, the site is a bit brighter. So let me just hop back here and... Uh, Okay, so uh, at the bottom of the website, uh, in the middle, you have this link. It's the uh, score calculator here. Uh, MD Said says 32. So I'll click on that score calculator and oh, up will pop another window. And then uh, here we have uh, listening and reading. And then you have a box here and you can put in the number 32. And then you will see that Saeed got uh, band 7.5, okay? Uh, Anjali Sharma says, I got 28, okay? Uh, Anjali, uh, 28 uh, is a 6.5, okay? Nadia got 38, that's going to be an 8.5, I just know it. 8.5 it is. Moria, 37, very good. It's 8.5, okay? Arda, 36. 36 Arda is a band eight. Okay. Okay, so um, you can check on the website. Again, you can join our full course anytime by clicking these big red buttons and it's a one-time payment for lifetime access. So uh, getting lots of practice exam strategies, it's a good idea. Uh, make sure to uh, Click on that and uh, begin improving for your next IELTS exam. That's it for today, everyone. Um, if uh, you have the time, please join me again tomorrow. Uh, members, it will be a question and answer session for you. Uh, of course, everybody is welcome to watch. And uh, for uh, everyone, we'll have some speaking part three, uh, practice. Vaishnavi, I'm happy that you had some good practice there. All right. Um, Arda, I'll, it'll be good to see you tomorrow as well. Again, check us out. ahelp.com, glshelp.com. I'm Adrian signing out from Budapest for now. It's late in your country. Sweet dreams. Much love to all of you. Keep up the good practice. Bye.